uh, I, I got updates from the hubs as well, so I'm, I'm very happy to say that we have more than 90 participants between the three hubs, the biggest one being in Yemen now with over, uh, with over 30 something participants. And the Sudanese one still is it's still a bit early in the day there, so it's saying don't write us off just yet. I wanted to say we have more than 100, but I'm being accurate, it's just 90 something plus. Uh, and as you can see, we're getting the questions here, which is, is really great. Something else that I wanted to touch on really quickly, because you heard Axel talking about IP version 4 and IP version 6 and all that stuff. Ojero well, here, and you heard Ahmad earlier this morning talking about uh, IP version 6 deployments. There is an IP version 6 SSID here, which is also something that we've done for the first time here in Minog. Thank you, Ojero, for, for doing this with us. Guys, please get online, try to see that. And for the techies in the room, if you see something that is not working the way that you expect it to work on the IP version 6 SSID, talk to the techies here, help them build their better networks in, in, in IP version 6. I'm sure they're gonna appreciate that as well as part of the learning curve that we have. Uh, so these were the two very quick updates that I had for you from the thing. Last, uh, oh, and the, the, the pictures from the remote hubs will be on the Twitter sphere soon. I'm not on Twitter, so I don't know how to do that, but we have people that will be doing that. Um, moving towards the last talk here, and, and again, you've probably heard and you've seen uh, Khaled when he was talking about uh, the, uh, the how we're now establishing ourselves more as a peering forum and not just an org for the region here and the reasons why and the rationale. And we have an excellent talk coming uh, up now that will, what will um, give real life case scenarios about what people see when they try to do business here from a very cool perspective, which is the gaming perspective. Uh, but I also wanted to mention one quick thing about that. So as part of building this event as a peering forum, we've, we, you could see on the agenda there are a few new things that have changed. So after that talk, there's going to be something called peering personnel. And peering personnel are basically people coming on stage for one minute, there will be a slide behind them, or even without a slide, that just says, you know, this is your AS number, this is your, where, where your peer, this is your peering policy, come meet me, and it will allow people to know who's in the room and, and who they want to do the business with. You're gonna see this in practice after the next talk, but this is something that we would like you to do. There, in the intermission slides, there is an email address. If you mail that contact information to that email address, we put up the slide. But also, even if you don't and you just want to come on stage, take that one minute to do that, right? Because this will help play nicely in what you have towards the end of the day of the two days, which is the peering bilaterals, where basically you can, you can schedule meetings with people that you want to meet here, all the CDNs, all the other operators, all the data centers within the room here. You can get some time to get business done when you're here in the meeting. And to facilitate that, there is the meeting app. Again, in the intermission slides, you're gonna see a slide about that. If you haven't downloaded it yet, download it. You can see the different participants here, or your data is GDPR protected, because that's something that we do. But, so don't worry about that, your, your privacy information, but it will allow you to be able to uh, connect to other participants here. Moving towards our last talk, Martin, yeah, you're over here. Please, uh, he will be talking to us about his experiences uh, in a very, like I said, interesting case, which is gaming. Who doesn't like games? Martin? Well, um, I'm going to be talking about a case of frostbite in the desert, uh, video gaming in the Middle East. Why frostbite? So video gaming companies are basically building engines over time that are reused for many different games. One of the first engines that were actually hosted in the Middle East is actually called Frostbite, which is maybe a bit ironical. The second one that's moved in now is Snowdrop. But anyway, moving on. I3D.net is a, an Ubisoft company nowadays. We'll go to the next slide with what? All right, there you go. So i3d.net has been in the video gaming industry for, well, a long time. We were founded in 2002, and in 2004 we actually started to host infrastructure, not just for the PC gaming, but also for Xbox, PlayStation, uh, nowadays Nintendo Switch, and whatnot as well. So we are doing more than just the, uh, you know, the, the, the standard hosting that you would be able to see from a normal uh, private company. So we always were working on that and uh, opened our first non-European locations uh, in uh, Tokyo and in Sydney back in 2008. And since then we've opened many more. So we are active on literally every continent in the world. 
And um, back in November 2018, we were actually acquired by Ubisoft, one of the biggest game publishers in the world. Uh, but we remain independent and continue to host various other games from other publishers. So to give you an example of some of the titles that we are running in the Middle East, uh, you would think uh, FIFA, uh, the Battlefield series, uh, Star Wars Battlefront, uh, Rocket League, uh, Tom Clancy's The Division 2, uh, as well as um, Miscreated. And uh, what we are seeing is that the new locations are typically driven by customer demand during launch season. Uh, that's why you're actually seeing only the newer titles here in the Middle East, because at that time we have the marketing budget to be able to build a community here, uh, which is not something that's easily done if you just plop down the infrastructure and wait for people to come. So last thing to note is that we are operating our own long haul network. Uh, we do so because that gives us control over where the traffic is going and it also allows us to uh, yeah, be a bit more resilient as DDoS attacks uh, given the fact that video gaming can attract some heat sometimes and yeah, bandwidth here in the Middle East is not so, uh, not so cost efficient that you'd be able to put down a lot of it without uh, actually using it. Um, then some technical info regarding video gaming, right? Uh, the thing that we have here is that uh, video gaming is a real-time business. So you're talking about a business where milliseconds matter. Uh, you can't cache it, so even if I wanted to, I would really love to, I cannot put caches in every network. It's simply technically impossible. And uh, the reason for that is the, the content is too unpredictable. And moreover, because there is a centralized server that is uh, synchronizing the events between the players, like for instance, somebody shooting a, a soccer ball at a goal or uh, shooting a bullet. You know, you can't wait until these things are synchronized over all of the caches in the region. So that's why we need to, to, to bring everybody to the central server for the region, in our case, that's actually Dubai. And uh, yeah, that way we can also group the player base so that the matches are always available. Because if you think about it, if you have, let's say, 10 games and the games have uh, five game modes and uh, 10 different maps, you know, you really dilute the player base like that. So the other important thing to know here is that uh, video gaming uh, rendering, the, the video actually is rendered client side means that there is only very little traffic between the video gamer and the central server. Now, this is good and this is bad, right? Uh, it's good because it's obviously very cost efficient. I mean, your user could be watching, let's say, a uh, video streaming service, uh, which consumes a lot of bandwidth and puts a lot of load on your network. On the other hand, they could be playing a game and consuming much less infrastructure uh, resources. And uh, the volumes that we are seeing are actually expressed in kilobits per user rather than megabits. This does mean that the video gaming network like ourselves might not show up in your top traffic networks, even though the impact of interconnecting with us will be the same, if not bigger than interconnecting with one of the big traffic sinks. So we started out in Dubai, uh, obviously as outsiders, because we're Dutch, we're not from around here. Uh, because, well, we were looking at it since 2014 or so. Uh, what really scared us off was the lack of interconnection across borders in the region. Uh, that's why we were so hesitant to build out for a very long time. Back in 2016, however, we had uh, enough of a business case that we could you know, put down servers, even, even with these disadvantages. And uh, we, uh, we decided to get started in uh, Dubai specifically. Why in Dubai? Uh, well, we saw that in the UAE IX, uh, there were a lot of people connecting from a wider region. So we could reach not just the UAE, but also, let's say, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, uh, some ISPs from Qatar, uh, Omani telcos, etc. And uh, this really helped for us to, to build the case to make sure that we had enough people coming together in this hub to actually start the games. And uh, the other thing that helped for us was that we had uh, existing contacts with the uh, data center operator Equinix. They, you know, doing the 
business a lot easier than it would have been if we needed to do a one-off. Uh, the other thing that helped is that uh, the DKIX team, uh, Marco and Bernd especially, really did a lot of introductions for us with all the local peering people. Uh, one of the challenges that we had was that we couldn't find really the right people to talk to at the usual peering forums. Uh, so yeah, we've had to basically make do with uh, other ways to, to get to know the right people. Moving on. So immediately after we went live in the fourth quarter of 2016, we had a couple of challenges. So for video gaming, ideally you want to be below 40 milliseconds round trip latency. That's the ideal. At that point you're competitive, you can do esports, you can, you know, win the games relatively easily. However, up to 100 milliseconds is still acceptable. I mean, you can play, you won't be the best, but you can play and it's enjoyable. Over 100 milliseconds, basically the performance just drops off to a point where, yeah, there's no more point in really playing. And what we are seeing actually is that if you don't have the local hosting and the local connectivity, I think there's maybe a, a quarter or maybe a fifth of the people that would normally be playing uh, if there was good service available. So the reactions that we got were uh, occasionally negative. Of course, there were a lot of good things as well. But uh, a few of the common remarks that we saw was, uh, why, why don't you put servers in uh, well, whatever country that uh, I'm from? Or uh, why don't you, uh, you know, try our special routed internet exchange product? Um, but that's actually partial transit, guys. That's something different. Uh, Another thing that we heard was, uh, well, I mean, the video gaming latency in Europe is fine. We don't need this local, local gaming thing. Go away. Uh, of course, that was uh, uh, not really the answer that we were looking for. Uh, so what we did is we thought, okay, maybe we need to attend a few events. So we went to the Capacity Middle East event because in this community, it's often the wholesale people who are doing the uh, peering and interconnection policies and uh, had a lot of meetings. Uh, we joined a lot of those uh, scheduled by uh, UAE IX uh, as a very uh, you know, productive cooperation. Uh, the other thing that we saw, if you don't mind going back actually, is uh, built-in VoIP chat. Uh, so video games, uh, the reaction speeds are low and people are already occupying their, both their hands with the controls of the game, meaning that there's really no time to type in the chat when you want to communicate. What we see here is that in certain countries, the VoIP chat is being blocked by the government or by the telco or whatever because, well, VoIP typically competes with the normal business of a telco. And yeah, that's of course not why we are providing that VoIP inside the game. So if you're doing this, please reconsider because you're really hampering the, the, the gaming performance for your, your country. So protectionism, the my country only, that's actually a bit of a trap. Uh, what we have seen here is that everybody, like I said, is asking, why don't you put the servers in well, my country? And I would have if I could have, uh, but unfortunately it's not the case. So what we are doing instead is we need a, a multiple fallback paths in a region because if you know one internet exchange fails or maybe a connection to an internet exchange fails because fibers get cut that's life we need fallback paths instead of routing you through Europe uh, you know on the way to the destination you should also keep in mind that not every application can actually scale to a multi-country deployment so video gaming is one example but I'm sure there are many many other use cases where you simply cannot do the caching approach. And what you should consider is that if an acceptable experience cannot be provided, then yeah, people are going to leave your ISP and move to the competitor. And what you're seeing here on the left is actually, well, it's not very readable at the moment, but there's a real world conversation of Twitter users basically complaining at the help desk of their ISP that, well, I mean, the latency is not good, when are you going to fix it? You've still not fixed it. Come on, come on, come on. I'm moving to the competition because they've got it sorted out. So it's really driving your customers away. And I've had 
telco executives basically coming up to me, telling me that their children are smuggling in 4G uh, modems from the competition so that they can play games. So it's really alive in the, in the younger community that are basically telling their family where to uh, buy their connectivity. And the last thing, of course, is that it's uh, uh, appearing across borders is a, a new business opportunity for carriers that are basically able to monetize their backbone investments in the region. So rather than basically selling everybody the connection into Europe, it would be much better if people were also going to connect within the region, let's say from uh, one country here uh, across the Gulf to another country here. Um, on again. Thank you. So around the same time we went live in Dubai, we actually went live in Johannesburg in South Africa as well. Why am I mentioning this? Uh, because it's a night and day difference in how things work in this region and how things work in South Africa. In South Africa, I think within three or four weeks of going live, we had sorted out nearly all of the hairpinning issues in the routing. We spoke to the local ISPs, uh, the, the round trip latency, because you no longer had to go to Europe and back again, was lowered by around 200 milliseconds, which is enormous. And uh, yeah, we were also invited to join some internet exchanges remotely. So in this case, we went to Angonik. Uh, we still saw in certain cases that there are some scenic routing, uh, meaning that the traffic is still taking a very long path uh, in case certain prefixes are not correctly announced. However, we found that if we emailed those network operators, they would usually realize, oh, wait, it's a mistake, I can type, and it's fixed. So uh, that was really good, and once it's fixed, well, I mean, it stays fixed, so that's positive. The other thing to note is that incumbent networks often connect to multiple IXs in a country, even if those IXs are com deployed in competing data center ecosystems. So one thing I really found very interesting is, for instance, Liquid Telecom. Uh, they obviously own one of the big carrier hubs in uh, Kenya. And uh, we were talking about the asteroid internet exchange that's going live in Nairobi, or sorry, in Mombasa, my bad. And so what I was asking is, you know, these are deploying in another data center that's not owned by you. Are you going to join? Well, of course we are. And in fact, uh, Liquid is even pairing in uh, Fujera. So they are going from Africa into the Middle East to make sure that this traffic stays local, even if it can't stay in the same continent. You know, Kenya to Fujera and then Dubai is still a hell of a lot better than, you know, going all the way to Europe or to Asia. So, um, if you wouldn't mind going ahead again. The trouble that we have seen here is some harmful transit engineering. A lot of networks in the Middle East are actually doing selective routing announcements. What does that mean? So um, when you have multiple carriers as an upstream or let's say multiple internet exchanges, it doesn't really matter. Uh, you basically take your address blocks and you're carving them up in little pieces. And to transit A, you're announcing, let's say, uh, a quarter of your address space. To the next one, a third. To the next one, another third, etc. And so the trouble with that is that uh, if you're only announcing a certain prefix to a transit that you're backhauling all the way from Europe, let's say Frankfurt or Marseille or whatever, there's no way I can reach you locally. Not with local prep, not with traffic engineering, there's no way I can find a local path to you. And that's problematic uh, because if you are looking at uh, the difference in latency, right? Uh, this is an example from Pakistan where we are seeing this a lot. So the actual latency that is possible is 22 milliseconds in both of the, uh, both of the uh, ingress and egress paths are staying local in the Middle East. Now, if we are only seeing part of the prefixes, then you will see that the ingress path is taking the green short path, which is good, but the egress path is going all the way into France and all the way back again. And the difference is over 600%, nearly 700%.
And this is the difference between being able to play the game and being able to hit things and, you know, just dying all the time, making it not enjoyable. What can you do to fix that? So we find that the reason why these uh, more specific announcements are often used is because we are trying to traffic engineer, right? We want to basi basically spread the load across multiple ports, make sure that every of those upstreams are efficiently utilized, that you're not burning away your commit and capacity, etc. So instead of doing it with more specific announcements, what you should be considering is something called BGP communities. BGP communities are like sticky notes that you can put on a route. So you can say, let's say, um, I want this route not to be announced to network A. Uh, or I want to see that the path seems artificially longer if it's coming in over a uh, path XYZ. It doesn't really matter. But the point is, uh, you've basically got a blank slate. The user defines the meaning. And uh, yeah, that meaning may be that instruction. It may carry some information like where is this route learned. And it allows people to select the shortest path even if the actual AS path length might be longer. And uh, this is widely implemented by the larger transit carriers, especially the tier ones over in Europe, often publicly documented, but also in uh, the region. I mean, we are publishing this information. Uh, a website called OneStep is actually collecting such documentation as well, but third party, not so much. Um, what you can do with the uh, traffic engineering uh, stuff is then basically you know, shift the traffic without moving the path completely, allowing people like us to take this path. And uh, yeah, I already explained most of this, but basically a good example would be a community, in this case for Omantel, which would stop the route from being announced to Netflix, which is often a big traffic sink, so that there is capacity again to bring that traffic local. We go to the next one, please. Yeah. Better yet, peering video gaming content directly. Uh, what we are seeing here is uh, a network from Kuwait. And uh, this network could, in theory, have 16 milliseconds round trip latency between Kuwait and the video gaming cluster in Dubai. What we are seeing instead is that they prefer to use the transit uh, because, well, I really don't know why they would do it, but in any case, what we are seeing is that in the ingress direction, everything is okay again, and in the egress direction, 810% more latency, uh, making it literally unplayable. The good thing about peering the video gaming network directly is that you can safely send your entire customer cone to us over the direct session without really impacting your transport capacity between the internet exchange and the country where the end users are. Just like we said, I mean, we have very low volume and due to the direct session, I mean, you know that we are not going to redistribute this amount of prefixes to half of the world, and therefore you have really granular control. And if you need some help with your routing policy or if you need any tips about who to talk to and who might be relevant to your interests, talk to your internet exchange team and they probably have a pretty good idea. So in the Middle East, North Africa, we have some progress since the first time I gave this presentation in November. What we are seeing is that the regional transit providers are peering more. Uh, it's often explicitly requested by the downstream customers of them because this is important content to them. We're seeing that ISPs from Iran, from Kuwait, Oman, and Pakistan actually optimize their routing announcements to localize 100% of the traffic to our cluster in Dubai. What we're also seeing is that new internet exchanges are being launched. So there have been uh, multiple new internet exchanges in Saudi Arabia, there's been a new internet exchange in Kuwait, and I know, uh, in fact, yesterday or maybe the day before that, the new internet exchange was launched, uh, announced at least, in Bahrain. So more and more of these are coming. It's a good development. We're getting there. And uh, the only thing to keep in mind is that if you have uh, an IXP in your country, but you set a very high tax or a very high tax on crossing the border, you kind of kill the business case of peering across that border and make problems. 
So we are doing our best to uh, yeah, fix as much as we can. We extend our backbone to Jera to join Smartup IX. That will be going live in the coming months. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that video games are being released with full Arabic localization, even down to the menus that are uh, flipped around basically so that let's say a health bar is going from right to left instead of left to right. And uh, yeah, of course, this game also has in-region servers from day one. I wanted to conclude, if you want more local video gaming in the Middle East, you need to keep asking the publishers of popular games why there are still no local servers in the country. Because while we are getting there, there is still a lot of work to be done with new games coming online and not having servers here, which is frankly stupid. Then consider, we have centralized infrastructure, no caches. So if you're doing traffic engineering, will you have collateral damage? And of course, we can help to investigate high latencies. We can even make recommendations on how to reach it the best way, etc., etc. Finally, internet exchanges are there to help you connect with those networks that matter to your business. And please, please, please peer across borders wherever possible and connect to multiple regional hubs. Don't stay in your own country, but go across the border. And that's it. This on. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Channel Five is very excited to have you. I have a question on the slide where you were talking about um, traffic Dubai to Kuwait. Can you hear me? Yes. When you're talking up from to Dubai to Kuwait, and yes. uh, was the example? Did the operators at both sides have link, or are you saying potentially there's a submarine cable that could? Is that what you're saying? No, I mean, there's operators that connect to the exchange in the UAE from Kuwait uh, that don't actually peer on that link, even though it's there and even though they are connected to the internet exchange. And the other thing that we are seeing as a big argument why Kuwaiti operators are not coming to the local internet exchanges is that it's obviously a new experience, right? Because peering didn't used to be such a big thing in the Middle East, at least not peering on an IX. So they are finding it difficult to justify even trying it out due to the fact that they need to pay an exorbitant amount of tax to get this backhaul circuit installed. And on the one hand, I understand what the regulator is trying to do. They are encouraging people to keep the traffic in the country, but it's not possible to do so for everybody. So it's, so it's not clear to me what the issue is in that example. Are you saying, so it's not a routing issue per se, it's the fact that they don't have the contracts and the, re the, reason the reason they don't have contracts is because of that tax that you mentioned? It's, it's a combination of things, right? Uh, so, uh, I mean, they have the, the contracts and obviously if you are an ISP, if you are only able to reach content in one country, you're not going to get very far. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, the... So the, the, the main problem is that it's too difficult for them to basically get their feet wet and it should be made easier to, to get started, basically. Can you be more specific? What do you mean by that? Sorry? What do you mean by that? Get their feet wet and get started? Well, I mean, if you are not, if you haven't appeared as a company in the entire, entire existence that you've been around, then justifying the cost of that inter or that link across the border to a project that you don't know is even going to affect any traffic or improve performance for your users is very difficult. So people want to be able to measure the difference so they can have a good story internally about why they should procure this link, why they should procure this internet exchange port, etc. Thank you. Rami Hashish, Noor Data Networks, uh, Egypt. Um, I want to question uh, your selection to uh, Dubai as a location uh, in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, why don't you choose uh, a more central location like Egypt? Sorry, why did I choose? 
a more central location like Egypt? The problem that we saw at least back in the day uh, is that we need countries from a wider region to connect to this internet exchange. And let's say that back in 2016, when we launched this pop in Dubai, uh, at least, uh, we couldn't find a lot of activity from the Egyptian incumbents on the internet exchange in Cairo, I believe. And secondly, we saw that it was basically going to be a one country pop if we were to do that. And quite simply put, uh, no matter how large you are as a country, uh, you're never big enough to basically justify one pop for one country. So we need more operators from the region to connect to the internet exchange to make it feasible. In Dubai, this was available. In Cairo, unfortunately, at the time, not so much. Okay, understood. Thank you. Michelle. Um, hi there, Nishal Govardhan, curious person. So thank you. Uh, I always like seeing presentations with data and, and seeing the some of the information you presented was really interesting. Um, I also work for a small CDN. We, we, uh, we do DNS. And, and one of the challenges we have is convincing people that DNS is important. Of course, you and I know it's important because it's what drives the internet. But sometimes it's lost in the crowd for give me more gigs. Now as a, as a DNS provider, I know it's, it's often difficult to convince people those few kilobits a second or 100 kilobits a second or what we would call a large exchange that's doing 30 or 40 megabits a second is, is huge for mm -hmm. us. How did you manage to have those conversations? How did you sell people on peering with you when the traffic levels are, are not in the gigabits as they're looking for? Because I, unfortunately, um, whether it's this region or whether it's uh, the region I'm familiar with, Africa, or even Southeast Asia, they're looking for those gigs. They're looking for peers with large amounts of traffic, not necessarily the, the important traffic. Let's put it that way. So I think anybody who is uh, trying to set up a peering is basically trying to make a big impact, right? I mean, if you have uh, type a BGP session to every network, that obviously doesn't scale, and route servers go a long way in, in helping with that. But what we find is that uh, here in the Middle East especially, um, having a low amount of traffic is actually an advantage because the backhaul prices between countries are still astronomically priced in many cases. So we find here that while normally we are saying, okay, look, we are so big and we are going to able to send you a lot of traffic and it will be great, in uh, this region we're actually saying, well, I mean, it's only this small amount of traffic and that is actually a way to convince people to come on board because they know that even if they set up that peering, they're not going to congest their backhaul link and they're still going to have a huge advantage because their users are asking for this content. And maybe that's where we are lucky in a sense that video gaming is a lot more visible to the end users rather than the internet plumbing of DNS. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the these are interesting data. Uh, Hossam from Google. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to ask you f first, congrats as well on uh, securing the backhaul deal between uh, Dalamina and uh, Smart Hub. And I would like to know what do you think you will accomplish with this link? What you will be able to reach through like uh, connecting with Etisala Exchange that you don't get through, through UIX? So I think you already know that there is an interesting situation in the UAE with the two competitors basically trying to safeguard their own ecosystem, right? The issue is that uh, when you're looking internationally, there's a lot of people that are not able to, to get into one of the two hubs at a commercially attractive rate, uh, whereas the other one might work. So what we're doing by adding this link is we are diversifying our presence so that we are easier to reach for a certain network. And of course, in SmartUp, there's AP Salat, which also helps the business case, of course. Okay, good luck. And trust me, if I didn't have to buy that backhaul link, I wouldn't have, but. Yeah, I, I, I it's, have It's a challenge inherent to my type of content. 